I am a wildland firefighter with the Forest Service. This is not my story, but from an old supervisor of mine that I believe completely. The setting is 2004 or so, Hell's Canyon area of Middle Idaho. His crew had been working all day on an emerging incident and were going to be working through the night as well. Being the assistant superintendent of the crew, second in charge effectively, he was out ahead scouting on an ATV or some such. He was working his way down a logging road that clearly had not been used in some time when a bobcat or lynx, it's been a few years since I've heard it, appears in the middle of the road, but doesn't run away as they usually would. This thing stands there for a good 10 seconds, screams at him, and scampers up a tree, not 5 feet off the road. He finds this odd, but not particularly unsettling. Just a half mile or so down the road, he finds a small cabin. Also odd, as this is federal land and no private structure should be there. Upon investigation, all the windows had been boarded, shut tight, and someone had done a pretty good job of doing so. The door now had been punched out and secured to a hole drilled into a log frame by a chain. Someone did not want anything getting in or out for that matter. Peering through the hole in the door, he can see that everything in the house is upset. This has him kind of unsettled, so he hops on his ATV and heads back up the road. Well, here's where it gets real interesting. Right where the bobcat had been, there stands a Native American woman in a badly tattered nightgown and bare feet, just standing there. He yells at her, asking if she needs help. She just screamed at him, the same scream as the bobcat from before, and climbs up the tree faster than any human has a right to be climbing. Obviously, he nopes out of there as fast as he can, unsure of who or what he just saw. He asks a local guy about the cabin. After asking around a little, a local Native American hears them talking and informs them about what they saw. They said he saw a pumawa, excuse the likely butchered spelling, in effect of skin changer or a warg. Now, I do not believe most people that tried to tell me that, but this was a serious man that I did not fuck around about many things, so he was dead serious the two times that I heard him tell it, and I 100% believe that he saw what he thinks he saw. A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on a great American road trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s, pretty broke, and as my mom had been a long-haul trucker, I suggested that we save a ton of money and we should sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut them up to make curtains. By the end of the first week, we had gotten this setup camp in about 10 minutes. We had our luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down, and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free camping sites, rest areas, and basically anywhere it seemed safe and semi-legal. There was never a night after the first night where we felt scared, until the last week on the trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and had gotten pretty used to our routine. We didn't go out on a set schedule and never worked or tried more than three or four hours a day. No destination really in mind, outside of a few must-see landmarks. We drive to places we found at night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals, and people we met. We'd also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of rednecks and met a campsite. In the back of their pickup, because I got hungry and overheard them saying they were going to go, we met an 80-year-old cowboy who took us out to drinking and taught us to line dance at a country bar. We played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm, got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them, and spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite. Basically, every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This night didn't look to be any different. We found a free campsite in Google and drove up into the woods, following our GPS. We were pretty far out of town and something seemed a little bit off when we pulled up to our campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. 
We pulled up near the RV and a man opened the door. Taz waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then, as if he hadn't said anything, he just slowly closed the door again and staring at us through the window. I was figuring he just wanted some privacy and he thought we'd be obnoxious. We pulled farther down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately while there was still light out, we goofed around for a little bit, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed out that a campfire farther down the campsite and we decided to go be friendly. We'd met so many cool people in the previous five weeks by just going up and offering beer or just chatting, so we wandered over. Near the campfire were two men, the owners of the cars we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly and we sat down and chatted with them. They were drinking and smoking so we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off and we came to find out that two of them didn't actually know one another. The older man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs and however, they seemed harmless. This left us chatting with the younger man who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing and we spent several hours just chatting about our trip, families, and everything. Then he started talking about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him and he pulled out his camera to show her some photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite and we both were a little freaked out. It wasn't of hurt us for one of us to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, so the idea of a bear hanging around in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed, and then his expression changed completely. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, if you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear you should be worried about. I, I kept waiting for the laugh and for him to nudge Ted's with his elbow. Jokes on the foreigner and they say the city girl, right? He never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed as well and joked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved to another subject. Within five minutes, the ranger had come back to it and was talking about something grabbing us from our car in the middle of the night. No matter how we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back on. The older man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars, not talking. We'd just awkwardly laugh and sip our beer and try to get the conversation going somewhere else. Then, the ranger stood up and walked towards the cooler to get another beer. At this point it was pitch black out and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. The beer cooler was outside the circle. Suddenly there is a red dark in the darkness. And it took a moment for me to realize that it's a camera. The ranger is holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen on the digital camera light up. Now it wasn't very often for people that we met to take pictures with us. My friend Tez is gorgeous, dark hair, blue eyes with like a young Megan Fox and we were pretty friendly. People like having pictures of themselves, too. It was an extremely strange thing to have this person taking pictures of us without asking or even indicating that that's what he was doing. We were both staring at him like deer in headlights at this point, but instead of realizing what he was doing is a bit weird, he checks his camera, adjusts some things and takes another photo, this time with the flash. Not asking us to smile or proposing a group photo and no explanation. After this photo, he comes back and sits down by the fire. Not a word said about the photo. At this point, me and Tez are mutually freaked out. We make some BS excuse that we need to go set up our campsite and nope the hell out. When we stand to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says, Have a good night. Ranger, however, looks at us and smiles and doesn't reach to anything. And his, He just says be careful out there. There's more than bears in the woods. Every hair on the body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rushed back to the car, which we only found in the dark by referencing the RV and jumped in the front seats. My friend Tez is all about hyperventilating. Why did he take pictures of us? I, I was shaking. I, I responded, I, I read the serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the car doors. Do you think he, he, he just took victim photos of us? We both freak out. She's in full panic mode, turns on the headlights of the car, and I immediately yell her to turn them off because now he knows exactly where our car is. God knows why, but that's the only night we used not to set up our camp. We didn't need to tear anything down, so we just got out of there as soon as light came. As we got into the dirt road, 
the ranger was walking towards our car and with that same cold expression. So I hope I never meet that ranger again. The summer after I graduated, I spent a month working with a nonprofit that took inner city high school teenagers aged 15 to 17 backpacking in a national forest for a week at a time. Most of these kids have never been hiking, much less backpacking. I had two girls on the second week say that they planned on not sweating because it is gross. I told them good luck on that. Going into our last week out, my partner and I are feeling great. We were getting pretty sick of the food, but we knew what to expect from 20 teenagers at a time, and most of the students were really having a great and enjoyable time. The first day of the last week, my partner accidentally kept the van keys that the leg the guide needed, so we had to go down and meet them and give them back while I stay with the 20 students. Half an hour later, I get a radio message saying that I need to come to the group to the site immediately. I put my group's student guide in charge and then tell them not to move from that spot for any reason. I ran all the way to the site and find a student laying on the ground next to a small lake. One of the guides puking in the water while trying to talk to the emergency satellite phone and my partner conducting CPR on the student. While my partner was meeting one of the guides from the other group to exchange the keys, the students decided to go swimming. One of the boys panicked while swimming out to the rock and started drowning. The other students decided to leave without saying anything. Their other guide and EMT swam out to save him, but the student was panicking so much that he started climbing out on the guide and almost drowned him. That's when the guy was puking in the lake. EMT had to swim away. Then, another student that was recently certified as a lifeguard tried to save him, but was also pulled under and had to get away. By the time the lead guide returned, the drowning student was completely submerged and no longer responding. The lead guide swam out to him and pulled him out from the lake, but my partner ran back. He had heard screaming and shouting and knew there was a problem. He told a student to radio me. Right before I got there, his heart had recently resumed beating from CPR and he started to breathe on his own. I monitored his breathing while talking to the emergency personnel. Once the emergency helicopter landed, I ran out to meet them and escorted them to the student. They hooked him up with an IV and carried him out. I ran back to my group and escorted them back to the bus pickup location without being able to tell them what had happened. They were understandably upset for having their trip cut very short and having to sit in the same spot for two hours. I let them open all the boxes of cookies and whatever other food they wanted to eat and brought them for the whole trip. My team, my other two guides, my owner, and myself went back out a week later to recreate the timeline of events for the lawyer's insurance. On the way out of the forest, the owner of the company got two flat tires and three of us had to stay the night in a random motel, then rent a car out the next day to drive back to the city, since we couldn't all fit in the tow truck. The student survived. He wound up staying in ICU for over a month in medical-induced coma to heal his lungs, but amazingly survived. I never saw him again, and we were not allowed to contact him. I hope he is okay. I spent about three months on a wilderness excursion with a group called NOLS. For the first segment, we spent two and a half weeks backpacking through the Gila National Forest. Now, to give you an idea how far into the backcountry we were, we carried all our food for about six or seven days. We found our own water and wiped our asses with rocks. Got the idea? Good. So we were about five days into our first ration. We're meeting a pickup truck to a remote dirt road the next day and had to pretty much take a shortcut so we wouldn't miss it. If we did, we'd have to wait another week for food and we were already pretty low. We made the decision to cut through a section of private property in order to save a few days of travel to make it on our location on time. However, we weren't able to make it all the way through this property and still able to camp near water access. Well, we scoped the area out and found that there were a couple old rundown hunting shacks, but they mostly looked abandoned or just used during the hunting season. We found a nice grassy field to build camp in a soft bed under some pine nettles 
to set up our kitchen area. Well, we've got a dinner on our camp stoves, tent set up, and sun is setting. And from the trees, we see a hound bounding over a long, bearded, long-haired hermit dude screaming at us. If you've ever been out in the wild or lived in a rural area, there are two types of people you will find being hermits. One, the kind that are absolutely insane and have spent the last 40 years eating the wrong kind of mushrooms and gun collections that would put a city armory to shame. Or two, they are the kind of person who moved away from people in order to find inner peace and commune with nature. We were pretty on the fence, which this guy was. Well, as he comes running over shouting at us, who the hell are you and what are you doing on my land? Not wanting to get shot or murdered in the middle of nowhere, we tried to calmly talk to him. Oh, we didn't know we were trespassing. We were just passing through on our way up to ration meetup. We're so sorry we can leave if you want. Well, how long are you staying for? He whipped back. Just for the night, we'll be gone first light in the morning. Oh, well then, you can stay. Well, that went smoother than expected. Turns out, he used to be a raging alcoholic and a motorcycle enthusiast. He got riped drunk at a bar one night, tried to ride his home on his bike, crashed somewhere along the way, and woke up three days later in a hospital. His BAC was over the lethal limit. By no rights did he have lived through that. That day, his wife issued him an ultimatum, give up drinking forever or lose her and the kids. When he left the hospital, he found a real estate office, asked for the most remote plot of land available, and built a house there. All my friends were drunks, and I couldn't be around them. I had to move, and I didn't know anyone here. So I found me this plot of land, built a house, and now I make furniture out of Wispin. He invited us up to his workshop the next morning. I was just glad that when we woke up, no one was missing. Next day, he showed us up at the shop, introduced us to his lovely wife, and we said our goodbyes. We started saying goodbye with handshakes by the end of this. He was giving us bear hugs with tears in his eyes. And that's the story of Crazy Harold. I worked in Olympic National Park on Reveg Crew. One day, I hiked to this off-trail lake. I was walking around and taking pictures when I heard a weird sound. It sounded like a blow dryer for a few seconds, and then a nom 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 sound. I looked around and there was a black bear about 15 feet away from me. I started slowly backing away from the bear and I stepped on a twig, which snapped. I mean it was like a cartoon. The bear took one step at me, and my heart stopped for a moment. Then it hightailed it up the hill off of a ridge that ran up around one side of the lake. Bears move fast. The bear then followed me around the lake, him up on the ridge peering down at me. Me down on the edge of the lake wondering if I should jump in the lake if he charges. I got an awesome photo zoom shot of him peeking around the tree at me and showed it to one of the rangers. He recognized the facial markings. Apparently, this bear had been notorious for walking in the campsites, raising himself on his hind legs and then eating everything on the camp at once while all the humans ran off screaming. The rangers would come out with paintball guns and just keep shooting him until he went away. Eventually, they decided that he had to be put down because he was too comfortable with humans and that wasn't going to end well. They didn't see him again after making the decision though, until I saw him at the lake off of the trail. I was working as a prospector's assistant in central Manitoba one summer. We were doing a helicopter-assisted magnetic anomaly investigation. It was the best summer of my life. There's nothing like ringing in your ears dissipating after the helicopter has dropped you off and the slowly increasing volume of the bugs taking its place. You know for sure you are in the middle of nowhere. It was the last day of our campaign. This was a little piece of the property close enough to a road that we didn't need a helicopter. It was a low priority target that was saved till the end. We had kicked so much ass during the high priority targets that we decided to do this one on the last day just for an easy in and out of the bush. Around 9 a.m., we heard yelling in the bush. Odd, nobody else should be out there. We kept on grabbing samples and it's back of our mind. Around 11, we hear it again, a little closer this time. We call back and again it's silent. 
Now, through our travels of this 30 kilometer piece of property, we came across many pieces of animal evidence. Deer, moose, and rabbit droppings were everywhere. A few carcasses here and there, bear tracks and bear feces were seen a few times, but nothing prepared us for what happened next. Around noon, we were in an old blast hole from the 80s. Prospector Dave told me he used to have a blasting license and that blowing shit up in the middle of the forest while drinking beer was a favorite pastime of prospectors until they changed the laws after a few too many forest fires. We were facing due west with our GPS on some rocks getting the most precise UTM we could. When we hear an earth shattering a bone and chilling how. I looked at Dave and he turned so white that he was almost green. I picked up the GPS and put it in my belt unclip my bear spray safely and then at our nine o'clock facing due west another wolf another at our ten and then there was another all the way to our four dave calmly said we need to leave but you cannot run if you run you die we left most of our sampling shit there we also carried these modified steel sledgehammers for breaking rock and scraping moss most useful durability thing i've ever had it's the ready long with my bear spray and we walk. Longest walk of my entire life. We didn't say a word and I didn't hear anything, but I'm positive they followed us back to the road into the truck. We drove back to the town and proceeded to get thoroughly, thoroughly drunk. I worked on a hotshot crew at the time for the Forest Service, so we spent two to three weeks out in remote areas. We covered a large amount of ground on foot. Generally, nowhere near trails or common backcountry traffic. We found weird stuff before, like stashes of guns, creepy old trapping cabins in AK, and picture cabins of like horror movie S with rusty traps hanging from the ceilings, and even to shoot a bear once that had too much interest in our spike camp. We took a bear matters very seriously after a crew member was attacked by a bear in 2008 while performing a burnout operation. Well, one day, my buddy Greg and his saw partner were following the fire, cutting line. Suddenly, Greg noticed a pair of Carhartts half burned on the ground. Oh, Carhartts, redneck Greg said with enthusiasm, plopping chew spit out. Greg's saw partner knew something must be up when he noticed from a distance that Greg pulled us out his chew and flicked it on the ground. Greg saved his chew for two use cycles of consumption and his partner gave him that chew just before an hour. As Craig picked up the incredibly heavy pants, they still had legs and part of the vertebrae inside them. The upper half of the body was totally missing. Turns out, some poor guy got torn apart by a bear. They found the rest of his body about a quarter mile away. Must have happened years ago because the remains were all bones. The Carhartts were completely intact. We thought it would be a great Carhartt commercial though. I am a wildlife biologist and former wildland firefighter. I wouldn't say anything too strange, but definitely some very interesting encounters. I used to work on one of the largest wildlife refuges in the country, right on the Mexican border. So I ran into border crossers all the time. Most of the time, I would see them because they would flag me down because it was too hot and they were giving up. Sometimes I would just be thinking to trail cameras and I would hear a bunch of rustling when 10 or so people scatter in all directions. One time, I brought the SD from the trail cam at the very remote water hole back to the office to check. The first pictures I saw of me installing the card were maybe five minutes later, a group of about 10 guys, all carrying 50 or so pound packs filled with weed and guns, come into the water. I'm sure they were just watching me and waiting for me to leave, and I knew this stuff happened a lot, and I know with lookouts and what it's probably happened to more than I know, but... It was still kind of eerie. A similar thing happened on a trail cam in South Africa with a leopard. I walked by it, and he walked by the opposite direction, coming out from where I was walking towards. About one minute later, he obviously heard me coming, stepped to the side in the bush, and waited for me to pass, with me none the wiser. Another time, in South Africa, I was half dozing off in the forest and heard something next to me. 
I was researching some Mongo monkeys, and at the time, following a troop, so I figured it was one of them. I looked over, and there was a honey badger about three feet from my face staring at me. I kind of made a quick small movement, and he made a very surprised face and ran in the opposite direction. I wouldn't say any of these were strange as much as cool, but they were interesting and pretty creepy at the time. I am a seasonal ranger for my local forest district. Despite the fact that I live in a fairly suburban area, the forest preserves still make up 12% of the county, with much of the property being heavily wooded, not far out wilderness, but pretty secluded in some areas. Being a seasonal employee, I have been on the job for a bit over a month now, but in my short time there, I have found quite a few things. 1. A dead man in a tree. The rest of the rangers say they find out about one suicide a year. so. There was the one for the year. When we go around opening parks each day, we drive through to make sure everything is okay. In this instance, I was driving through and had just lost sight of the road when I saw a man hanging from a tree in the clearing. He had hung himself. I called the cops and the coroner. Friggin' coroner took about an hour to show up and he was only one with a ladder long enough to cut the guy down. So I stared at the dead guy in a tree for about an hour. Two. Crazed, drugged up naked man running around a parking lot took me and three other rangers to catch the damn guy. When we finally caught him and found out he had multiple cuts across his body from running through brush and rocks lodged firmly up his ass. And three, the headless deer. Normally, when a pack of coyotes takes down a deer, yes, they have a bunch of coyotes around here, they leave bite marks all over the body along with torn flesh everywhere. But the head was cleanly sliced off and placed directly next to the body meaning this is something created by human intervention. We still haven't figured out what that's about yet, and I've only been here for five weeks. The scariest experience I had as a backcountry ranger in Washington State was being stalked by a cougar for a day and a half. I was hiking up an unpopular trail to an old shelter that had that creepy being washed feeling. I had seen fairly fresh cougar scratches and scats along the trail, but that's pretty common up here, so I wasn't worried at all. That night I camped at the shelter, which only had three walls and a roof. I felt uneasy all night and hardly slept. At one point, Chiding to myself for being paranoid, I arranged my emergency foil tarp around my sleeping bag so I could at least hopefully hear something if it approached me as I slept. The next day, I found fresh scat and brush off the trail. I was hiking on. About a mile past the shelter, I found a mostly eaten deer and some dense brush off the trail. Cougars often keep kill stashes throughout their territory for lighter snacking. Now, a cougar won't usually tangle with a human, but here I am, 5 feet tall, a 100 pound sack of flesh and bones, and at least 13 miles out from any other humans. I decided to cut short my 3 day trip and hunt footed it right back out of there. The last 2 hours of hiking through the dusk and dense forest was the most hair raising hike I've ever had. I didn't know if I was capable of being that hyper vigilant. As a fuel botanist in Oregon, pre-legalization, I always was told by other supervisors that if I had any time I should stumble upon black hoses in the woods, it was to immediately turn around, head back to the base and let them know. Apparently pot farmers used the hoses to pipe out water to their crops hidden in the BLM or FWS land. Your stories. I'm a park ranger. Another ranger and I were out on a search and rescue call once. The missing person was a man in his 20s. He had gone hiking and had not returned the day that he intended to. When we got the call, it was nighttime, but we hiked in a few miles and set up camp on a ridge that was in pretty good view. He had gone to the woods prepared, so we decided to wait until daylight before beginning the search. About 2 a.m., I get up and am taking a piss when I see a moving light at the base of the cliffs across the valley and a few miles away. It looks like a flashlight beam. I tell the other ranger and we make the decision to keep waiting for daylight. The next morning, we decide to go check out the area and bring this guy home. 
We get approximately to where I saw the light from the night before and start calling his name. Soon, we find his body at the base of the cliff. He had fallen 60 feet on his head. The body was badly mangled. We radio back that it was now become a recovery instead of a rescue. At this point, the other ranger yells and tells me to come look at this. Lying 20 feet from the man's body was his mag light. It seemed odd, but I thought nothing of it until the other ranger reminded me of the light the night before. It kind of gave me creeps, but I still dismissed it. Before too long, the coroner arrived and expected the body. After he took the body back to the lab, he said that the man had been dead for at least 48 hours before we found the body. All of a sudden, the oh shit alarm went off in my brain. I knew that it couldn't be possible. I had the coroner review his work with the same results. I tried to find an explanation for the light that I had seen, perhaps of the hikers, but one search and rescue guy had stayed at the trailhead in the entire night and no one had come or gone. To this day, I have no clue what I saw that night, but it freaked me out. My brother Jay was a part of the orienteering team in high school. It really helped him get ready for being a state park ranger. For those of you who don't know, orienteering is when they put you in the middle of nowhere in teams of two, give you a map and a compass, and you must find your way to each check-in station, in order, and it's a race. So my brother and his partner set out, make it through the first few checkpoints, and are feeling pretty solid. but. They don't make it to the next one when they think they're supposed to. They double check the map, do some math, and figure out that they miscalculated some angle or another and are now lost at the edge of the map. They recalculate and set off in a new direction. Keep in mind this line was never intended to be part of the orienteering run. This is unexplored territory, and they came across what my brother said could only be described was a crater, a deep bowel in the forest, devoid of trees. At the center of it was an ambulance. They were in the woods, miles upon miles from any roads, and there is an ambulance that looks like it's decades old sitting in a crater. So being teenage boys, they go to investigate it. Fuck the race. My brother said that the forest was well on its way to reclaiming the vehicle, and that it was just rusted and covered in paint and plant life. It looked out of date, like it came from the 40s or some bygone era. In the back, the gurney was still there, but bent in the middle, like something had smashed it. There were brown smears on the walls that could have been rust or dirt or… blood. They both got a horrible feeling from the place and took off out of there. My brother thinks he could have probably find it again, but flat out refuses to. So who knows what happened in that crater in the middle of the woods in that ambulance. I'm a park ranger, and I like to hunt. And when I say I hunt, I don't mean I sit in a tree stand. I mean I'm the guy out hunting by walking over the entire park with enough on my back to let me sleep at night sort of comfortably by little enough that I won't mind dragging 150 pounds of yummy out of the woods. Alright, so I'm hunting a fairly large forest somewhere in the northeast corridor of the US. It's not uncommon to run into people on the edges of the woods. It's fairly uncommon to run into people in the middle of the woods even during hunting season, unless you're on the trails, which I wasn't. And it's decently common to run into the ruins of buildings from the 1800s. I happened to be hunting a new valley that I was pretty sure had a crossing in it. To set the view, I'm sitting on top of a steep shale slide, looking down into a valley with a creek running through it. Approaching this plateau, there's a knife edge that runs up and down the ridge, but there's really no way to get up to that spot except if you're seriously determined, drunk, or foolish. Getting up here creates quite a bit of noise from the stones sliding on the stones, which means I know I need to sit up for an hour to let things settle down before I made the descent. Since it's such a pain in the ass, I left my day pack at the bottom under a pine tree and only had a rifle, binoculars, water, and an energy bar. 
I'm up here for about three hours glassing this little piss of a stream looking for something to cross it, seeing nothing but squirrels and birds and I finally decide to start glassing the opposite hill of sheer boredom. I am 90% sure I chose a poor spot and wasted an afternoon looking at nothing, such as hunting. It's got really interesting days and it's got really boring days and that's why it's called hunting and not shooting. As I'm screwing around with the focus of the binoculars, I catch a glimpse of something which almost looks like a person, if they were wearing dark blue clothes and about 4 feet tall. 99% of the time, the day hikers just pass by without realizing I'm here, even with the blaze orange requirements. Or they pretend to ignore me, but you'd be amazed how many times someone has almost walked through my stand. Anyways, this person wasn't moving, which started to make me think I was wrong. It was just standing there, behind the cover of some low scrub brush and tree branches, and I would have missed it if it were not for the color. I zoom out a bit and realize that I'm not looking at a person, but it's actually a collapsed cabin. I was looking at where the door would be, except it really did look like a person, and cabins aren't blue. I move the zoom back to the door and play the focus for about 5 minutes and I can't get the person to come back. In fact, the cabin door now has some light from the setting sun visible through the holes in the walls and roof. Whatever four foot tall thing I was looking at has moved. <sighs> Teenagers, right? I have that thought and then realize something else. I still can hear birds and squirrels and all the other things in the woods which typically would go quiet when they notice something. Which means that they didn't notice me, but that also means that they didn't notice whatever was in the cabin door a short time ago. I'm doing my best to stay quiet and not move, and whatever it was certainly did move. I would expect everything in the woods to have gone for cover with a teenager crashing through the brush, but the noises almost made it worse. There was stuff moving in the brush, but the problem was, the stuff was moving around in the brush. I started to think that it was a trick of the light, since the sun was setting, and it was getting to that part of the day when tree stumps looked like deer. I knew it would have to move soon and figured it might as well pack up because I still had to get down to the shale and get back to the pine tree where I planned to throw a tarp and sleep. At this time, I realized it wasn't dark per se, but it was overcast now. Again, the creepy experience isn't that there's something obviously wrong, it's that everything is so completely normal that I would expect that I was alone. About this time, a fog rolled into the valley which the combination of overcast, weather conditions, sunset, and a ground fog coming up into the wet, low valley has signaled that it was time to leave. I checked my safety, put the caps on my glass, and reached up to take down my orange flag. The moment I grabbed the flag, the dread came. That's the only way to describe it. The woods went from animals going home to sleep to full on you're fucked. The movement had attracted what I could only describe as a thousand invisible eyes which all turned in unison as they noticed me. Ever, ever wonder what a deer feels like in the, the headlights? This definitely has to be it. Then I heard the children. I, I heard children laughing. Not teenagers, not adults, not women. But full on five year old kids laughing like they caught a firefly. I had hiked in five miles the previous day through woods and put down more today when I woke up and got to the spot and I distinctly hear children laughing during what I could only describe as the most creepy moment I have ever had in a valley. I know it's completely unoccupied having stared at it for at least four hours or so. I am pretty sure my feet only touched the shale three times getting down the knife's edge and I made a ton of log noises doing it too. At this point I didn't really care. I grabbed the pack and my flashlight and absolutely full on fucking ran to the next hilltop. I killed my light halfway up the hill and then went to the top of the hill where I threw down the tarp and unrolled my foam. And there I sat all night watching the hill I just came from. About a year ago. I started dating someone who worked as a state park ranger who I'll call Jay. Jay lived on the state park property in a two bedroom house tucked into the woods. We set the alarm and settled into bed around midnight with Jay's two dogs between us and a third dog created beside the bed. For some reason I couldn't fall asleep so I lay down listening to the dogs snoring and the deafening silence surrounding us while Jay slept. And then it started. A repetitive bouncing sound of some sort was coming from outside the window, 
less than a few feet from where I was laying on the bed, as if someone were dribbling a basketball on cement. The pace would speed up and slow down. The sound would become louder and softer. This continued for well over two hours. I wholeheartedly wanted to believe that I was hearing what were simply sounds of nature, so I ignored it. Next came the creaks in the walls. I know that houses make sounds, but this was unlike anything I have ever heard before. These sounds started in the hallway as very, a very faint creaks. The creaks became louder as they reached Jay's bedroom, and what happened on the wall at the same time as going counterclockwise around the room until eventually it reached the wall beside me. The creak in the wall beside me was so loud that I jumped and the two dogs jolted from their sleep, and all the while I'm still hearing the bouncing ball outside the window and getting more nervous by the minute. And then at 3am, I hear it. I hear the most ungodly, terrifying growl shrieking from the center of the house. It was so loud that Jay flies off the bed, grabs a shotgun hanging on the wall adjacent from the bed and shouts, Is somebody in the house? And takes off down the hallway towards the sound. The dogs are going berserk and I'm in tears, absolutely beside myself pleading with Jay that it was not a person. Jay comes back into the bedroom after not finding an intruder or anything of the sort and says it must have been the dogs. I tell him it certainly was not the dogs, as I was awake the entire night and the dogs were asleep in the room with us. Maybe an animal got caught underneath the house. Yeah, maybe, I say. Somehow, after I've calmed down a bit, I drift off to sleep. The next thing I know, Jay is on top of me with his hands around my throat and with the meanest look on his face, jerking my head back and forth, suffocating me and hurting me. I can't make any sound and I'm struggling to push Jay away and that's when I wake up. It was all a vivid dream. Jay is asleep beside me. In the morning, we walk into the den and find a heater turned on full blast. It was the middle of summer. Jay only uses it during the winter months because it was the original furnace was quite tricky and it was pretty broken. I'm convinced something in that house did not want me there. That growl will forever haunt me. I'm a park ranger, but I'm mainly an environmental educator at a nature preserve, so I spend a lot of time outdoors in some isolated areas. There's one area of the park I try not to take groups of kids anymore. Once in a while, we have to go through that trail since it's a shortcut to the kayak launch. When it's 95 degrees outside, you're ready for anything that'll make your trip a little bit shorter. When I started, there were one of the first things that I did was to familiarize myself with all the areas of the preserve. So I spent quite a bit of time hiking through all of the trails and even the rarely used ones, since I have to know my way around to navigate groups or go rescue someone if they get lost, which does happen. One part of the preserve is an old homestead site of a now abandoned pineapple plantation. It was settled in the 1890s. We don't know much about the family beyond the name and the approximate year they settled there and the approximate year the homestead was abandoned. This is in southern Florida, and there are thousands of similarly abandoned homestead sites. The early settlers of the area had to be tough as snails. This was a pre-railroad area, and the nearest town was about 5 miles south through what would have been wilderness and no real roads. So these guys were on their own in a land absolutely bursting with mosquitoes, panthers, bears, and bad water. Water table high is high fresh water, but can easily be contaminated by the salt water nearby. In other words, Early homesteaders were badasses because that was the only way they'd survive. There's a narrow trail that is through what it was once called the homestead site. On one of my first days, I decided to trek through there. I got about a half mile in when I started to get some weird vibes. I've always been sensitive to my surroundings and have spent enough time in isolated natural areas to know that if something doesn't feel right, it probably means your instincts are picking up on something you should pay attention to. Usually this means your brain is picking up on minute movements on the ground that indicate an unfriendly snake that may be nearby or something else that you don't want to confront. So I stopped dead in my tracks and let my mind go quiet, looking around very carefully for warning signs. There weren't any, and I didn't see any recent tracks, but the vab vibe I was getting was still there. I shrugged it off and kept going to the trail, getting narrower, and the vibe vibes getting deeper into my gut. I felt that it was being watched and followed. 
Now, this is an isolated area, so the possibility that a person was following me was remote, but possible. I stopped every few meters, but there were no sounds. Actually, none at all. Not even birds. I started to sweat and my heart started to race. One thought kept echoing my, in my mind. You are not welcome here. You are not welcome here. Turn around. You are not welcome. Well, fuck that, I thought. Just jittery from nervous noof job feeling, I thought. I came to a bend in the trail and I stopped. My feet would go no further. In my mind, the phrase got louder. You are not welcome here. You are not welcome here. I heard a crash coming from behind me. When I turned around to investigate, there was no one. Not an animal, not a human, nothing. The vegetation was sparse enough that I would have been able to see something. I turned around and left. I put it down in nerves or me being a wimp or something and sort of forgot about it. About a month later, I'm taking a camp group through the kayak launch where the kayaks await us. I decide to take the groups through a narrow trail that saves us about 10 minutes. I get to the same bend of the trails and the kids have gone silent. These are 9 year olds in summer camp. They're not silent, and they're never silent. I look behind me to see that one kid who looks as though he is scared shitless. I don't like it here, he said. Why not, I asked. He looked me dead in the eyes and said, I feel like we shouldn't be here. I couldn't turn around at that point, so we hustled to the kayak launch and as all was well, but we were all a little on edge. I took another group through there a trail a week later and again the kids were silent and at that bend of the trail, for some reason, they just felt very unsafe. For that whole summer, whenever I cut that shortcut, kids would go silent and get those bad vibes. I try not to go down that stretch at all anymore if I can help it. Obviously, this is nothing more than a gut feeling on my end, but only a few other times in my life have I felt a gut feeling so absolutely strong. I don't know if it's the spirit or whatever homesteader was there or something else, but it's hard to describe. But it definitely doesn't want people trespassing, that's for sure. As a park ranger, sometimes we would seek out ghost towns, and I went with my other friends on a few of these excursions that they would go on. Most of the time, you would find one that was relatively well known. Things are overgrown, but there were signs of squatters, campers, hunters, vandalism, etc. One time, we found out about a very small town that was abandoned in the 20s. After a ton of research, he loaded up supplies and planned to hike to see if he could find it. After several unsuccessful attempts on solo attempts, he brought me along. The hike started out at an old abandoned railroad junction that was in itself 5-10 miles off the road. We followed a rail line for about 5 miles that kept diminishing as we went. Eventually, we got to a point where there was no longer any sign of the railroad line and we kept going. He was an experienced hiker and had planned where we wanted to go this time. After about 15 or so miles, we found it. The town itself was very small. It was there about five houses and a really small general store. Think about the size of a small convenience store. What was left over the houses were in a relatively decent condition and a couple of them had been abandoned very quickly. Furniture and pictures left behind, clothes and other belongings packed but not taken. It was surreal. We found a letter that was dated 1922, which was about the time the town speculated to have been abandoned. The store had some product left on the shelves, but this was not like a store in the traditional sense, maybe more like a trading post. There were a few advertising signs and a few boxes of soap flakes and canned items that we couldn't make out. I guess the story was that the town was existed because it was on a rail line. There was a grain storage facility that was originally located a few miles away from the rail line. My uncle speculated that people in the town either owned and ran the grain facility, and the grain facility burned down and the rail line was diverted away. Thus, the little town died. Or it could have been that the rail line diverted and then the grain facility burned down later. Either way. Like I said, I had been to a few ghost towns before. This was like anything I'd ever seen though. The people that lived here were relatively well off, not rich necessarily, but this did not mean that they were having any troubles. This did not appear to be a farming community like you'd expect. Everything just looked frozen in time and there were no roads anywhere nearby. The closest paved road was probably 30 miles away. It is possible that there were a bunch of handful of people who saw this place since it was abandoned. And this place is in the middle of nowhere my uncle found out about the town by seeing a reference to it on a very very old railroad map.
My family used to work on a forestry as park rangers. Deep in the forest, there was a dilapidated house that used to belong to an old guy named Spike, who was a hard-ass mofo. People who displeased him had a habit of going missing back in the day, and there were plenty of effed up stories about him around town. I have two first-hand stories from visiting Spike's hut while camping out there. One time, my dad drove my friends and I out there to scare us all. It was a freaky place and you always had that feeling of being watched. I felt that it may have been aboriginal spirits or even spikes, but it was a very ghostly vibe and it made everyone just feel very uncomfortable. This particular day, as we were driving through his property, we saw a guy slumped against a fallen tree on a hill with his fat covering his face. We all told each other he was sleeping, but his body has positioned extremely unnaturally and we all got spooked by the thought that he looked dead. Dad said when we drove back through that if he was still there we'd check it out. So we drove further into the bush. When we came back through two hours later he was still there and hadn't moved at all. I told Dad we had to stop and check it out like he said and he just kept driving and completely ignored my mention of the guy and pleased to stop or anything. I still think that it was a body that had been dumped. One. When I went back out there with my friends a year later, we drove around looking for the hut a few hours and finally found it. There were hundreds of beer bottles and 44 gallon drums filled to the brim and it was obviously someone had been there. The house was completely fucked and there was no way in hell you could sleep in there, no matter how desperate you were. So this was strange. We walked up to the small shed next to the house and there was remains of a huge fire with a steel grate over the top and the inside. Next to it were ashes, what looked like a Christmas cookbook, and children's clothing, tiny socks and charred baby shirts and pants. We all looked at each other and silently Power walked back to the truck and got the fuck out of there. I've not been back since and that was really freaking scary. There was a group of teens that hadn't been heard from after their scheduled return trip for their camping. A co-worker and I headed out in the general direction that the teens had set off in. We had been hiking for most of the day and had seen nothing. We're about 35 kilometers into the woods at this point when we start noticing odd things. Sticks carved like spears stuck into the ground, weird carvings in the trees, and a child stuffed animal hanging from a noose up in a tree. This place was nowhere and, and no roads were anywhere. It wasn't to regular trails either and people just normally don't come here. The really eerie thing is that everything was freshly carved. Somebody had been there within a couple of hours of us and made these things. Mind you, we're still looking for these teens. We kept on the hiking trail and eventually made camp for the night still kind of on edge from what we had seen earlier but we settled down anyway and get some sleep. We get up at sunrise hoping to cover more ground, but before it gets too hot, we pack up the gear and get ready, and we notice a bit of a shirt that had caught on a small tree and ripped along as some shoot prints. We were thinking, great, maybe we're close to the teens. When a radio call comes in, the teens had just been found 20 kilometers east of us and they're calling everybody back. All those weird things had been seen from the day before come flooding back into my mind, and we wasted no time hiking out of those woods. So. I don't know what that was, a group of strange people living in the woods, maybe some murderous serial killer, or maybe something entirely different. About seven years ago, I was on a backpacking trip with three friends. One is a park ranger, the rest of us are bios as botany nerds, and all four of us saw something we still cannot explain. Day one went off without a hitch. It was a bit long and a lot of elevation gain, but nonetheless we set up camp and heated beans and rice under what was one of the clearest summer skies I can remember. This was Washington, and the night sky from the mountains is just unreal. Day two was different. 
all four of us awoke shortly before dusk to a shield scream. Not super uncommon, most of us are pretty seasoned hikers, campers, and backpackers. The sound of something getting killed is pretty universal. None of us quite could make it out, though. If I remember correctly, we assumed it was a coyote, the familiar yelp slash wail. Anyways, it was pretty close, which is probably why it woke us all up. So, we started scoping out a small radius around the campsite. We found what looked like somebody that had put a bomb in some kind of animal. No evidence of an actual explosive, I'm just trying to give you the same picture I had in my head. A totally indecipherable heap of flesh and fur, probably about the size of a German Shepherd. Similar fur coloration too. We discussed how odd it was for a bit, then decided more or less, eh, what are you gonna do, and moved on. Best explanation was something tore into it and bailed, maybe by the sound of us waking up. Day 3. Did you see that? We were winding down from a fairly short day of hiking. Tired from the past two days, I remember us joking about being old farts and now not being able to hustle like we could a few years prior. The sun was just making its way down over the tree line while we busted out the whiskey and started boiling a pot of walker for more beans and rice. I'll never forget this moment as long as I live. One of the crew was just launching into a story about his ex, and it went something like this. Yeah, so she was just about to be the worst possible kind of, and then he gets cut off by a loud pop, which we unanimously recognized and described as a tree's last leg snap before it falls. We were all standing now, scanning the tree line. We're in a small clearing aside from the single tree we're next to. A few minutes go by without sound. Nothing. Then we start hearing the forest life make noise again, mostly birds doing their thing. We all settle back in, presuming the tree wound, out leaning against another tree instead of falling on the floor's floor. It sounds pretty close, but there aren't too many trees that we need to be concerned about. It couldn't reach us if it fell in the middle of the night anyway. Then another wail, like the one we heard the first night, except more distant. Though I never sense it, one of those crew says, sounded like it came from a cave, like it echoed. So we go looking for a cave in that general direction. We searched for about 45 minutes before one of us suggests that we just head back as we were going out of sunlight soon. More importantly, it's starting to get dark and we are a little ways from safety of our tents. We never find anything like a cave or something that could cause that kind of reverb or kind of body. We head back towards the clearing in our campsite when something catches my friend's eye. Did you see that? He's pointing across the clearing about 9 o'clock. We're taking a direct path to our campsite so it's dead ahead at 12. We're all looking in that direction, scanning the tree line. Where? What? Dude, I'm telling you, there was a person right there, just beyond camp. He is visibly shaken by it, and it's pretty obvious that he isn't fooling around or the thought that he could be mistaken. We're nowhere near a road or town, and even the nearest trail is miles away. A handful of times I've run into other backpackers in a similar way, people checking out your camp and heading in the direction of your fire. So the rest of us have pretty open, let's go check it out mentality. But the friend who saw the figure suggests we all take a knee and wait a while and hide in the tree line's cover. So there we are, kneeling in the brush staring at our own campsite from the other side of the clearing, when we all unanimously see a figure start to move against the brush from the 9 to 8 to 7 counterclockwise. Since we're effectively 6 o'clock, this becomes increasingly unsettling. I remember noting our ranger buddy readying his rifle and another friend putting a hand on his knife. We're all feeling the same uneasiness now, and I say we saw a figure, but really, we could just hear and occasionally see the brush moving in that area. My ranger buddy declares that it was just to be a bear, the original spotter whispering his argument about it standing like a person. Either way, we decided to get into the clearing and make our presence known, and that was the best choice. We either need to scare off the bear or confront this person. So we all stand up and jog to the clearing shouting, Hey bear, hey bear. This is more or less standard procedure in case you were wondering. Nothing happens. Nothing at all. Now we're all standing in the middle of this clearing, somewhere about halfway between our 6 o'clock position and our camp, just waiting for something to happen. We're about 20 minutes away from total darkness, and then there's another wail from our 4 o'clock, but our focus is towards 7. I whirl around before realizing one of us is already looking that way, and his face is totally pale. Then I see it too. We all do. There's a silhouette of a tall man leaning over something else, facing away from us, and then he clearly rests one knee before turning over our way. 
our ranger buddy with his rifle in the air. Hey, what the heck is over? He's about to lay into him for hunting when the figure comes full stand, hard to gauge, probably about six foot, and then takes off from uh, away from us. I don't mean to sound like a man scrambling to run away or anything, but it sounded like this thing was bounding off into the brush like Hussein Bolt if you were born and raised in the mountains. Never in my life have I ever seen anything like it, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. My first reaction was ghost. After a pretty long wait and arguing over it, which was what we were pretty much only had to do, we swung back to camp to grab a few flashlights from a camp and make our way over to where the figure was leaning. It was another amount of flash. Without getting too detailed, this time it was mistakable. Fox paws were intermixed. Again, it looked like it was exploded open and the meat was eaten on the spot and not harvested like a hunter. You probably wouldn't be surprised to hear that we didn't sleep much that night. We make jokes about encountering Sasquatch out there. I've never been a spiritual man and I'm still not, but it's very hard to take that shape of the inhuman yet human supernatural nature than the way it looked and moved, and none of us could do any kind of anything about it. Not to mention, I've never personally seen something kill like that. The closest thing I've ever seen is a deer carcass post bear. In a time of year that would not have made it very hungry or aggressive, it was closer to the hibernation season, which it would have been during our summer hike. What gets me is that we heard the same shrill wails three times in the distance between our two-day hike and our three-day stay. They were all from a distance of ten miles between each other, meaning we were on the same general game show as it was, or it was following us. I was a park ranger on a small island, the only year-round resident. Private boat access with only no bridge or ferries. It became crowded in the summer, but we did always empty out completely when the weather turned. I love the off-season with 400 acres to myself, with no phone, no internet, and sometimes though, I would get bored. I'd go out at night without a flashlight and challenge myself to hike the entire island in the dark. There was moonlight to navigate by, but there was also a stretch of the main trail that passed through the oldest trees on the island where I'd be plunged into total darkness. I was in the old forest one night when I heard something behind me. I turned and nothing was there. I turned back and something brushed my face. My stomach dropped and I swung my fist into something. I ran full tilt for a hundred yards, stomping into my big stupid boots with my gun belt bouncing up and down, my vest riding up to saw my throat. I stopped and bent over with a stitch in my side and started laughing. I held my hand in front of my eyes and ran my fingers over the prickled from the branch that I had punched. Though the spread fingers of my injured hand were hurting, I saw a smear of bright white off trail ahead. I figured it was one of the small herd of white rumped deers the locals wrongfully refer to as palminos, but it moved up a side trail before I could get a better look. I got my breath under control and followed. A hundred feet up the side trail, it split again and I could hear something moving through the underbrush, just past the fork and to the right. I crouched as I made my way to the fork and stayed low trying to keep quiet and unseen. The trail gains elevation as it nears the center of the island, where the trees spread out and the moonlight begins to lighten things up. I heard a sharp bark and froze, then crept forwards a few feet. I reached the fork and was straining to see ahead when I heard the crunch and crack of something in the brush behind me. I spun and saw a pale man, six foot taller with dark hair wearing a bright white t-shirt 30 feet behind me. He gave me a lunatic grin, barked again, and I had a sharp ha, and then turned off and ran to the woods. I stood still, scanning the trees, my hand to my gun. After not hearing any more things for a few moments, I backtracked my way to the main trail, then terrified and sped walked my way to the cabin. I hiked the exterior again that night with a flashlight this time, and checked the coast for evidence of any visitor, boater, or wayward traveler and there was nothing. I got up early and in the light of day, I did the same with the same results. I don't know who or what it could have been. The way he was running off the trail convinced me that he knew the island very well, 
better than me for sure, and that he was hiding out somewhere, but I never found any evidence of a secret lair, and I never saw him again.